Welcome to part two of two of my complete review of the MCU Phase 4. We've arrived at the television shows. I did it. I watched it all. Ten. Ten different shows and specials. In one Marvel phase. Can you say oversaturation? There was so much content to get through and watch, by the end I'd rather be talking about anything else. Let's talk about some music. You want to talk about music and you don't want to talk about what happened. No, it's all over. What are you going to say to your fans when they ask you some questions about it? I'm going to say I feel good. Papa's got a brand new bag. It's a man's world. Oversaturation when it came to Phase 4 was an echoed complaint even amongst the most willing shilling of Marvel shills. What do you say to three shilling? But when you sit through all of it back to back to back, it becomes absolutely numbing. I reviewed only one show for all of Phase 4 until this video, and that show was She-Hulk. And there's... there's just no way I'm going to devote the same amount of time to every single show as I did to that one. So I hope you're body positive, because this will be She-Hulk heavy. Lucky for us all, that show is endlessly fun to mock, so you get to re-enjoy me shitting on it in an extremely abridged format, just as I had fun re-editing it and laughing at it. So, it's a win-win. If you want to hear me break down the show episode by episode, you can find the original videos elsewhere on the channel, of course. Let's start completely out of order, just like the last video, and review Werewolf by Night first, because who even gives a shit? <laughs> Werewolf by Night is, as of right now, a one-shot television special that premiered on Disney+. Plus. It's actually, well, it's actually kind of cool, in that surprisingly good for a disposable thing way. Directed by Michael Giacchino, who's most famous for being a film composer, it's about a magical MacGuffin called the Bloodstone overseen by, get this, the Bloodstone family, known for their awesomeness at monster hunting. The death of the holder of the relic means there's going to be a hunting competition to find out who will be the next hunter to possess it. Our lead character Jack is a hunter and participant who, to his shock, discovers during the competition that he's a monster himself. The one shot is a throwback and love letter to the old Universal monster films, shot in black and white with plenty of references to classics like Dracula and the Wolfman. The director was a huge fan of the old Marvel horror comics and wanted to do something unique in the MCU. And I'd say he pretty much succeeded, but that's the kind of leeway you get with these smaller projects. This being an interesting and successful side story reminds me of what Andor is to the Star Wars universe. Critically acclaimed, pretty much forgotten about because of all the sludge around it. But it excels because it didn't have the weight of the entire franchise on its shoulders. It's something the director was able to take a moderate risk with creatively because it was financially riskless. I feel like this happens a lot with big IPs. As the franchise dwindles in quality due to oversaturation, the ones with the least amount of pressure on them have the freedom to be cool, crazy, and try new things, allowing filmmakers and creatives to be creative. Imagine that. We also get the introduction of Ted, or Man-Thing to everybody else. Another sign that these little projects are the ones where the C-list weird and quirky characters belong because mainstream audiences aren't going to go for a B, C, or D-list character in their major blockbusters at this point. Oh wait, Ironheart was in a $250 million production. Never mind. Where's my Man-Thing movie? This video is sponsored by Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal kit. Factor makes meeting your nutrition goals easier than ever by delivering fresh, never-frozen, dietitian approved meals right to your doorstep. Their team of gourmet chefs create each meal using only ingredients with integrity to help you feel your best all day long. Factor offers flavor-packed options on the menu each week to fit a variety of lifestyles, from keto to calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and protein plus. Prepared by chefs and approved by dietitians, each meal has all of the ingredients you need to feel satisfied while meeting your goals. Are you on the run or want to cut back on takeout? Factor is the way to go. Not only is Factor cheaper than takeout, but it's a lot faster than restaurant delivery and it's ready in two minutes. I'm big into fitness and I'm always on the lookout for the best prepared meal options because I'm just not into cooking and knowing exactly what's in my meal is incredibly important to me. And Factor takes out the guesswork. Factor has so many meal options that whatever your goals are, they offer something that accommodates your needs with 25 plus meals and 30 plus add-on options that are updated weekly. Head to Factor75.com or use the link below and use code MOVIECYNIC50 to get 50% off your first Factor box. Falcon and the Winter Soldier Watching all of these shows back to back to back, you really get a sense for what Marvel was trying to do with this phase. I pointed out about the moral ambiguity or straight redirection from the obvious when it comes to character motivations with other Phase 4 projects, but when you see it all in one giant lump is when it truly stands out. Giving Scarlet Witch's writing in Wakanda Forever a run for its money, Falcon and Winter Soldier is outrageously over the top when it comes to assigning guilt and determining who's right and wrong. 
Characters constantly have to tell you how you're supposed to be feeling about them or other characters. Yet nothing you're hearing passes the eye test. People who should be villains based on what you're seeing, you're supposed to feel empathy for. People who seem like they're in the right, you're told are entirely in the wrong. In this show, it's more glaring than any other Phase 4 product because it blankets itself in political commentary. Then dares you to say it's doing that, you racist. Look at this shit. The terrorists only set us back a bit. You have to stop calling them terrorists. There's still people in there. This is the only language these people understand. Falcon and Winter Soldier begins with Sam Wilson having issues wielding Captain America's shield, not for any logical reason, but because the show needs him to in order for it to justify its existence. So we're already off to a great start. Meanwhile, Bucky has been pardoned and is in therapy trying to reconcile with his past as the Winter Soldier, and a dude named John Walker has become Captain America. There's a terrorist group called the Flag Smashers. Yes, it's that fucking corny. Who are terrorizing in terrifying terrorist ways because they liked life better during the blip. Remember, you're not supposed to call them terrorists even though they murder people. They've all taken Super Soldier Serum, and their leader, Carly Morgenthau, also known as Freckle Jesus, is supposed to be a morally ambiguous character, even though she shouldn't be at all because she's a fucking terrorist. The show, along with a few others in Phase 4, constantly try to justify a character committing murder, terror, and evil because they either are sad or because they have some sort of trauma. You can make an empathetic villain, but no writing in any of Phase 4 tries to be nuanced or attempt to write subtext. It's blunt, on the nose, and you're told how to feel about a character instead of coming to your own conclusion based on that character's actions. We're supposed to feel bad and feel sympathy for Freckle Jesus, but we're supposed to hate John Walker and think he's gone insane because he rightfully kills a fucking terrorist. The show doesn't even have the balls to have Sam Wilson kill Freckle Jesus in the end. The script takes the weight off his shoulders and has Agent 13 do it instead. Pussies. This now classic meme-worthy line sums this show up nicely. You've got to do better, Senator. That'll stop racism. Very helpful, you dumb fucks. Hate this show. This is shit. This is a table of shit. Seeing Zemo again was the highlight, as he's my choice for best MCU villain. One that was hiding in the shadows in Civil War with a balanced and realistic take on a character's motivations. As the second Phase 4 project, this would be a sign of things to come, pushing an agenda over basic writing techniques. I'm not one to suggest politics do not have a place in media. There are just far, far better ways to do it than this. Fuck this show. <laughs> WandaVision. This fucking show. This is the one that kicked off Phase 4 back when people were still optimistic about the MCU. I watched this one episodically as it was coming out, and at first I thought it was pretty clever, with loving throwbacks to different eras of comedy television programs that the audience would be familiar with. That actually helped build Wanda's ideal fantasy world. Even typing it out now, that's a clever concept and a fun subversion of expectations. But that's pretty much what this show's legacy is. Something with good intentions and ideas, but doesn't just fall flat on its face. It makes what should have been an intriguing downfall of a hero into a complete character assassination. WandaVision follows up with, well, where Wanda and Vision were left after the events of Endgame. To spoil things for the uninitiated, Wanda creates a hex around an entire town to turn it into her little fantasy world. Using her powers to manifest Vision and two make-believe kids, and mind-controlling every person living in the town to do her bidding and play along with her every whim. The concept is cool, and Wanda, in theory, makes for an excellent villain. She was always relatively unstable and could be led one way or another, and it should have been a foregone conclusion that she'd eventually become one of the most powerful antagonists in the MCU, just like she is in the comics. But the show completely drops the ball, and I'll try and steer clear of her follow-up story in Multiverse of Madness and focus on the show, but Marvel tries to have it both ways. The script tries to force some idiotic sense of morality to the viewer instead of just going for it with her being a villain. All it ends up doing is making the character look idiotic and pathetic and the overall writing wholly inept. At first, we're led to believe Wanda doesn't know she's doing what she's doing, so we're supposed to have empathy for her, that things are out of her control. That's completely shattered by her doing this and exposing the fact that she's fully aware of what she's doing. It fundamentally breaks the script. Is this yours? This will be your only warning. Stay out of my home. You've taken an entire town hostage. Well, I'm not the one with the guns, director. 
Get fucked. The show carries on trying to push some morbid morality tale, trying to steer us, the audience, towards feeling bad that she's knowingly torturing people she put under her control and applaud her for eventually stopping it. I mean, listen to this stupid-ass dialogue. They'll never know what you sacrificed for them. If you won't let us go, just let us die. Hey, yo, what the fuck? Just FYI, as long as you have trauma, it's totally okay to do literally anything you fucking want, no matter how many people you hurt in the process. Nice message to kids, Marvel. Very modern. She's not a villain. She's experiencing prolonged grief. Is it any wonder that she becomes desperate for happiness? Ask any mother of a lost child what she would do to get her child back. This is a comment made in reference to her part in Multiverse of Madness, but it applies here too, and I saw endless comments echoing these sentiments. This is an absolutely messed up way of thinking. Agatha Harkness, the villain of the show, could easily be seen as the fucking hero. The script constantly has characters telling the audience how to feel about other characters instead of having their actions speak for themselves. Because that would just be too difficult now, wouldn't it? This set the stage for the shit show that would be almost all of Phase 4. The show started out promising, but became a complete disaster by the end. To the point where I'd say this is probably my most hated of all the MCU shows. It was also the first, but certainly not the last, to do the now tried and true MCU bait and switch. They introduced Quicksilver from the Fox X-Men universe, and I was pretty excited. Until the very next episode when they pulled the rug out from under the audience with a Ha ha, just kidding. And it wasn't the Fox Universe Quicksilver, it was an asshole named Ralph Bonner. Go fuck yourself. She-Hulk is labeled as a comedy and it's about as funny as Hannah Gadsby. Think about this. You're stuck in traffic and the lights turn blue. As a piece of entertainment, it fails in almost every category in its very first episode. You know, the episode that's supposed to grab people's attention and retain an audience? But the show fails at making anyone care about the lead character. It has shallow writing. It continues the trend of knocking down a beloved character in order to artificially prop up the replacement one. It completely fails at being comedic whatsoever. And its meta-commentary on gender struggles is painfully on the nose, condescending, and patronizing. There are so many things wrong with this show, so many layers to this onion, not even Shrek could get through it all. She-Hulk starts out with trial lawyer Jennifer Walters testing a purposely vague closing argument for an upcoming court case. Purposely vague because the writers said they realized they aren't good at writing courtroom drama. So instead of doing research to make their show better, they just kind of skipped that part. You know, the other major part of our main character that isn't about her being a Hulk? Anyway, she has a female paralegal colleague encouraging her and a male lawyer telling her to smile more. This scene tells you exactly what you're in for, so buckle up for this one. Yes, every male character is going to be a stereotypical douche, and every female character is going to be the opposite. Well, except Jennifer Walters herself. She's also a douche throughout the entire episode, but shh, we'll get to that later. Take a lap, Dennis. There's a hot chick over there. I'm going to go talk to it. Also in the superhuman lot of it. Yeah. No, I can't talk to a 10 about embarrassing man stuff. She could be my next fiance. Excuse me, ladies. I hate to see two stunning women sitting all alone. Can I buy you sexy ladies a round of drinks? Okay, sir, we're clearly in the middle of work here. When you change your mind, I'll be at the bar. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm an entrepreneur. Oh, in what field? TPD. <laughs> we should do this again. There's an idea. <laughs> this is Alan. Yeah, she's like a six. God, you're just so powerful. What a specimen. Did you just call me a specimen? As a compliment. Just at 600. I'm not even a superhero. Hey, can somebody take our order? Okay. Oh, no. Do you remember that date I went on with the guy, uh, the fetish? I know her. Ugh, of course you do. Yeah. It's creepy and disgusting. I'm immortal, so I can't die. I'm sorry, and, and, you, and you think that this woman who has a law degree doesn't know what immortal mm -hmm. Nikki's? Well, how funny is it that you have to point out she's a woman with a law degree? As if either of those things have any bearing on her knowing what a fucking word means that has A, nothing to do with her gender, and B, nothing to do with her area of expertise. Lawyers were supposed to not be judgmental. No, they are just they just have to represent you. I'm, Obviously, I'm out, ending I'm a relationship that is, is so messed hard. up. And after any of the like answers which I did... Christ, I'd off myself too in this situation. 
My friend sent me a link to a video posted on that site, Intelligentsia. The one for hateful man babies? Yep, that's the one. Even Pug, the one decent guy in the show, somehow oddly gets thrown into the mix too, as if the writers couldn't find another way to air out their grievance. I love harassing women in the workplace. It's my kick, baby. Not cool! I don't. You guys know me. It's this oddly mean-spirited, bubble-living therapy session for the writers. Like they're using Jen as a stand-in for every microaggression they've ever faced and are just constantly fucking put upon. We rewind a bit to when Giggle Girl and her cousin Bruce, aka Hulk, were on a road trip. Giggle Girl is asking Hulk about Captain America's sex life, which made me laugh. Obviously, Captain America wasn't virgin. Only because I thought about the outrage that would ensue on Twitter if, say, Black Widow's sex life was being discussed. And then a fucking alien ship appears in the road and they crash. Funny Girl saves Bruce by pulling him from the wreckage. Yep. Yep. And his blood gets mixed in with her blood and... Bam, 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 bam. An excuse for her to be She-Hulk. She runs off and finds herself at a cliché bar where cliché women walk in and are super helpful to her. Meanwhile, the men are cliché assholes doing more stereotypical shit. What's up? What's your name? So she turns into female Hulk and lunges at them in a rage before being stopped by Bruce. Then he brings her to Dexter's laboratory where he shows empathy towards her and offers her help. And she sees this as a perfect opportunity to belittle him and bluntly tell the audience that she's superior to him. Because I'm better than you? Mm, it's just basically different. In a better way. He continues trying to help her all the same and we get some more on the nose dialogue about the female plight. The triggers are anger and fear. Those are like the baseline of any woman just existing. All right then. And she, her Hulk, masters everything there is to being a Hulk in a matter of days instead of the decade and a half it took Bruce. The show even makes sure to point this out multiple times, in a way trying to pull the if we mention the stupid, it's no longer stupid card, while simultaneously using it to remind the audience how fucking awesome she, her Hulk is. She's pissed off and angry the entire time she's there, but under the careful construction of the least self-aware dialogue ever written, she explains how good she is at controlling her emotions because otherwise she may get slighted for it by men, catcalled by men, or even murdered by men. And that makes her a thousand times better than Bruce. Here's the thing, Bruce. I'm great at controlling my anger. When I'm catcalled in the street, incompetent men explain my own area of expertise to me. I'll get called emotional or difficult or might just literally get murdered. I'm an expert at controlling my anger because I do it infinitely more than you. Shut up! Shut the fuck up! There's a lot to digest in that scene alone, but I'll circle back to it, I promise. Anyway, she tries to leave, and the neutering of the Hulk continues when a dude who stopped a fucking alien the size of a skyscraper dead in its tracks with his fist is straight up lifted and thrown by Giggle Girl in her Jeep. Then again, I've been told I don't own a Wrangler, so I just wouldn't understand. They end up getting in a fight, and then for whatever fucking reason, Hulk changes his mind and tells her it's totally cool, go ahead and leave and do your thing since you're already the fucking Tom Brady of being a Hulk. We fast forward back to the present, where she's about to give her closing argument at her trial. The stereotypical dumbass man tells her not to screw up, then before she's able to actually give the argument, some random villain shows up and Giggle Girl hulks out and stops her. Then says some more unfunny shit, and uh, the episode's over. Now let's break this shit down. If this is supposed to be a sitcom, and it's actually labeled as a comedy, I haven't spoken to a single person yet who said they actually found anything amusing in the show. At least not unironically. Comedy is subjective for sure, but there's a general consensus regarding the MCU that the comedy aspect of the universe falls flat a lot of the time. Considering jokes were falling flat even when Robert Downey Jr. was giving them, I assure you Tatiana Maslany and Mark Ruffalo aren't delivering humor better than he did. Nothing really happens in this episode besides what you already saw in the trailer, and I ask the same question about this that I did about Thor Love and Thunder. It's supposed to be a comedy, and since it's not funny, what the fuck are we even watching? What is this? Well, I'll answer it. That is one big pile of shit. As mentioned briefly, the writers themselves said they realized that none of them are good at writing anything related to a courtroom. The first scene, Jennifer is giving some vague closing argument that sounds like word salad, and the next opportunity to give her closing statement is at the end of the episode, where it's cut off before she could even begin when she's interrupted by a random supervillain attack. Keeping in mind what the writers themselves said and what happens in the show, if this doesn't speak to the word lazy when it comes to writing, I don't know what else would. It's literal laziness. 
And it also shows laziness on behalf of the studio, or at least where their focus is, because they didn't give a shit about hiring a writer who's good at writing what the story is actually about. Almost every single character is unlikable too, especially the main character. I'm not sure why we're supposed to be rooting for her. This character is shitty, rude, mean, and clearly we're supposed to empathize with her because of her feminine plight. But that's just audience manipulation in the most lazy way possible. It's not good writing. Speaking of writing, let's get back to this scene. I'm an expert at controlling my anger because I do it infinitely more than you. So all of this just feels like projecting. For starters, it's on the nose and completely inappropriate as far as the story goes. We have an affluent woman whose biggest issue is being catcalled, telling Bruce Banner that she has it harder than him, multiplied by a thousand. Story-wise, this is outrageous because of everything Hulk has been through. She's already belittled him multiple times for his use of behavioral therapy techniques, he's suffered through mental health issues leading to a failed suicide attempt, and he sacrificed his entire life for the greater good and gave up his physical well-being to bring back four billion people. I mean, he's kind of suffered as much as anyone, if not more, but we have someone comparing being catcalled and told to smile as not equivalent to, but more difficult than, anything he's done in his life. This is more than a writing issue, though, because this scene is written for the meta, for the very specific targeted audience watching at home, not for the characters. The scene even slows down and plays some manipulative, sad music behind her oh woe is me pity party dialogue. As far as writing, it was pandering, condescending, and eye roll inducing. It's in poor taste considering the story context and who the characters are. The thing about a scene like this is someone talking about it negatively is put in a lose-lose situation. It's clearly meant to be talked about. Otherwise, it wouldn't have literally been shown in the fucking marketing for the show. That marketing's gotten some backlash because character-wise, it's plain old stupid bad writing. Coupled with the studio actually advertising this makes it quite clear it's not about the story. It's about the agenda they'd like to push. Mark Millar, world-famous comic book writer from Marvel, DC, and a number of creator-owned graphic novels, pointed out that art, and particularly comic books, have been political since their inception. The difference now is the blunt nature of the writing, lack of tact and lack of care that goes into what's being shat out by these studios. Meanwhile, you have the main actress saying that there's a strange fascination with female bodies in the MCU. Some more hilariously tone-deaf comments that completely ignore this. This is encapsulated by the continued dumbing down and destruction of Bruce Banner, aka Hulk, who was once a highlight and an actual draw for audiences, but now is undercut, belittled, and shown up by his counterpart in every way. A reminder that Marvel can't seem to write new characters without beating down and humiliating the beloved ones that came before. See, what we did was, we made a copy from two. And you know how sometimes you make a copy of a copy, it's not quite as sharp as, well, the original. I got a lot! It's a shitty way of getting a character to their awesome status without having them experience a full satisfying arc where they get there in the end after loss and struggle. They're just instantly good at everything and better than everyone else because... Because they just are, so fuck you. Additionally fascinating is how she, her Hulk, is treated poorly by all the stereotypical men, and she's so good at controlling a response to vocally antagonistic men that she turns into She-Hulk and physically attacks them. And her interactions with Bruce, the one man in the show treating her with compassion, are written where she treats him terribly in every conceivable way. Because I'm better than you? Mm, it's just basically different. In a better way. So all of this just feels like projecting a lot of shit onto me. And I'm sorry that I said a bunch of harsh but very true things. Wow, an apology that still doubles down on a thing you're apologizing for. On one particular occasion, the show even goes so far as to unironically glad hand itself for using basic writing techniques. Connecting the A and B story? Nice. <laughs> As if to point out its own cleverness, completely ignoring the fact it doesn't even have an overarching storyline. Conveniently though, the showrunners and creators use any criticism of the show whatsoever to attack its own fan base in the real world, just as it does with its own meta commentary. You don't think the show's funny? Wow, you must be fun at parties, you fucking misogynist. Fucking misogynist. Let's try and fix this steaming pile of shit. The first thing I'd do is never greenlight this show to begin with. But since that's not the point of this exercise, what is a basic thing we could do to fix this abomination? Well, for starters, we could give Jen a character arc. Wouldn't that be something? And if we were to do that, how would we do it? Let's stick with the idea that the writers wanted Jen to be an unlikable character. Characters with shitty personality traits are usually the best, but we typically call them villains or antagonists. Our hero or protagonist 
or as Mr. Plinkett calls it, Protagonist. Can have asshole traits too, but since they're our hero and main focus, it would be wise to give them at least some redeeming personality trait, or something that tells us they're going to find redemption or better themselves as the story progresses. You have to give the audience a reason to root for your hero. Since this is a comedy, let's take a look at Michael Scott from The Office. What a fucking disaster of a character he is. And as a protagonist and our main character, he's written masterfully. He's constantly fucking up, saying horrible shit or doing the wrong thing. Oh god. Busy work. Oh, get away, Cretan. Um, you need to have him signed by then, or much earlier. Chillax, Pam. Stop Pam MSing. Like that, uh, dwarf from Lord of the Rings. Gimli. Nerd. That is why you're not on the team. Just trying to... But the show is smart enough to make us feel bad for Michael when it's right, or finds the right moments to remind us that he has a good heart, that he generally means well, and really loves his employees and friends. Pam Caso. Sorry I'm late. I had to race across town. You did these? Freehand? Yep. Look at this one. Wow. You nailed it. How much? What do you mean? I don't see a uh, price. You want to buy it? Well, yeah. I'm really proud of you. As far as Jen goes on the show, she's simply a narcissistic alcoholic with, let's face it, zero redeeming qualities. There's absolutely nothing about Jen that any reasonable audience member would like other than the fact that she's the main character, so we're supposed to. Giving her any sort of positive character trait to remind us of her humanity is necessary, regardless of whether or not this is meant to be a lighthearted comedy show. Second, the narrative of this fucking thing is all over the place. There's no overarching story. Instead, it bounces from scenario to scenario, each episode representing a new fluff court case and situation for Jen to be in for 20 minutes of screen time. I still find it hilarious that the show patted itself on the back for its writing. Connecting the A and B story? Nice. <laughs> what would correct this is having an overarching storyline, something that plays throughout the series up to the finale. What would have worked best was having the Emil Blonsky abomination case be that storyline, since one, it's a show about a lawyer and the law, and two, he's the most interesting case she had because of her personal connection to him and despite the fact that Tim Roth is not giving a fuck. Imagine intertwining Jen's personal character arc with the overarching storyline of Abomination's parole case. Perhaps Jen is narcissistic and is representing who she considers a villain, but seeing his change helps her along the way realize her own personality flaws and makes her want to improve. They mildly attempt that in passive fashion, with him popping up in all of two episodes before it regresses the character back to her shitty status quo, and this is easily something they could have done and done well. Then again, I guess you actually need to hire someone who knows anything about the law to write an intriguing court case. You could even go another route, where Jen's paralegal could be her voice of reason. A great example of this is the film A Few Good Men, starring Tom Cruise and Demi Moore. Tom Cruise plays the hotshot young lawyer who's never seen the inside of a courtroom, and Demi convinces him to take on a high-profile case that could possibly put his career in the shitter if he pursues the truth. Ultimately, Demi Moore's character helps push Cruise, becoming wiser, more mature, and essentially help him get his head out of his ass and actually kicking ass instead. I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! I did the job! Did you order the code red? You're goddamn right I did! Superhero films get a free pass to sample other genres, and even other films. So there's no reason they couldn't have taken a cue from that movie. They could have had a male paralegal play second fiddle to Jen. You know, possibly a male character who wasn't a fucking idiot. But hell, we know that isn't possible for this show, so you could still have her female paralegal be that voice of reason for her. It would give her a character arc, real progress, and we might actually like her. As far as the comedy goes, I don't know what to fucking tell you there. This show is about as funny as a colonoscopy, and the best I can do is tell you, maybe hire a writer who's actually fucking funny. All in all, She-Hulk is by far the worst television show I've ever seen in my life. It's a vain, sloppy therapy session for the writers using its characters to represent whatever wrongs they felt they dealt with in their lives. It's a show that has a target audience who doesn't actually watch it, nestled in a universe beloved by people the writers absolutely despise. I don't know how this pile of shit was greenlit, but here it is, in all its unholy anti-glory. In the end, no lessons will be learned here, 
the writers will most likely get an even bigger gig and then complain that they work twice as hard and get paid half as much, and no one will be better for any of this. But like the actress who plays Titania said, at least I got paid. <laughs> Hawkeye is a show that is about, but also not about, the least popular member of the original Avengers lineup. I'm all out of arrows, I don't have any more. So, uh, I guess I'm done, right? Yeah. All right, I'll be in the car, stay safe. I mean not about because it's really about his replacement Kate Bishop. You'll notice a trend over the last eight years or so through various IPs that they have a show titled after the legacy character to draw you in, and then it's actually not about them whatsoever. Please refer to Ray Palpatine and Luke Skywalker, She-Hulk and Hulk Hulk, Black Widow and Blonde Widow, Loki and Girl Loki, Thor and Lady Thor. The name is Mighty Thor. I don't give a shit! Indiana Jones and Girl Indiana Jones. Captain Marvel and Miss Marvel. Get the idea yet? The key difference between all of those situations and this one with Hawkeye is that Hawkeye isn't popular. Like, at all. So to capture what interest they could, they brought in a way more popular superhero's main villain from the Netflix MCU shows to try and keep some intrigue going, hoping people would watch with the whoa, they're bringing Daredevil into the MCU factor. The bait-and-switch title character Kate Bishop was just a little kid in 2012 when the events of the first Avengers movie took place, and Hawkeye inadvertently saved her and she became the one single Hawkeye fan in the entire universe. She decided she wanted to be just like him, and without years of military and black ops training, is just as skilled as him now in the present day as a young adult. She thinks her rich-ass soon-to-be stepdad is involved in some shady business with a group called the Tracksuit Mafia, and gets her wish of meeting Clint Barton when he sees her on TV wearing his Ronin suit she put on while battling them on live television. He ends up investigating the tracksuit mafia personally, meaning she involves herself and he eventually accepts her when she proves herself to him throughout the show. Hawkeye season one, and probably the only season, exists to add content to Disney Plus and introduce Kate Bishop, a side character named Echo, and of course the Kingpin to the mainline MCU. It's essentially a throwaway show that I didn't watch when it first came out, and only did now so I could review it, but there's not a lot to say about it besides it exists. There's the bait and switch, absolutely, but Kate Bishop doesn't outshine our legacy character the entire time or anything. She's saved by him multiple times and assists him in others. It's obnoxiously not about the character the title says it's about, but there would be worse versions of this new age trope in the future. The show is also aesthetically similar to Matt Fraction's run on Hawkeye, which was hyper-stylized with a lot of purples, whites, and blues. It's a beautiful looking comic book and it's cool to see it adapted here. Other than that, this show was a snooze fest that didn't need to exist. Loki, the ultimate offender of abusing your lead protagonist and telling your audience how to feel about the replacement lead character. Hey guys, this show is about X character. Then two episodes in, surprise, it's actually about Y character. And we're going to humiliate the shit out of the one you actually wanted to see. Loki is such a mixed bag of television, it's frustrating to review. There are elements I liked, but it breaks the MCU on some fundamental levels and makes a mockery of the audience's time and investment in the universe. How do you like something like that? An alternate version of Loki that escaped in Avengers Endgame, when the Avengers traveled back in time to the year 2012 during the Battle of New York, winds up in the hands of the TVA, an organization that functions outside of time and space that keeps an eye on the timelines. The TVA forces Loki to either be a race since he shouldn't exist, or help them out with a bigger threat, who winds up being Kang the Conqueror. If the existence of an organization functioning outside time and space is a little much for you, I get it. These things are based on comic books after all, but some things in comic books work in that medium and aren't necessarily adaptable into others, at least not successfully. They do their best, but this kind of thing doesn't work with cinema. For example, the Infinity Stones are shown to Loki while they're just sitting in a desk drawer, meant to kind of show people, hey, you thought the Infinity Stones were a big deal? This is even bigger, without any consideration for what that does to the viewer. It throws away and spits in the face of the investment the audience has had with this story for the past 10 plus years. Instead of what they intend, it comes off more like, hey, remember that thing that was so powerful it was the basis for the entire underlying story of the MCU and the heart and soul of the franchise Iron Man sacrificed himself over them? Well, they don't matter. How you like that, you little bitch? While we all love Loki as a character, the mere fact that they brought him back negates the impact of his sacrifice at the beginning of Infinity War. Yeah, this is technically a different Loki, but it's not. They have him sit down and essentially download the mind and memories of the Loki we did know into this one by showing him that Loki's fate since the first Avengers movie so that the show can just get the fuck on with itself. Don't ask questions. Just consume product and then get excited for next product. 
It's a sorry excuse for a plot device. It's trying to have your cake and eat it too. Another way the show nullifies what came before it, because we can't simply have a character be dead and gone. The MCU has to go on and on, forever and ever and ever. The coolest part of the show? The five seconds Loki was shown to be D.B. Cooper. I have almost nothing to say about this show. It exists, just like some others. I watched it. It's a thing. Miss Marvel is a show that came to be because of Disney's desire to push for representation in every respect. The best thing I can say about the show is it stays moderately true to its comic roots aesthetically, while completely changing the character to try and accommodate the cinematic universe. The premise follows Kamala Khan, a young girl who's obsessed over Captain Marvel and stumbles upon powers of her own. She'll be used in the upcoming Captain Marvel sequel because nobody likes Brie Larson. Originally, the character of Miss Marvel was an Inhuman, but that show was poorly received, so why bother with that angle? The Inhumans were brought into the MCU to try and be X-Men light, and then Disney bought Fox, so guess what? Miss Marvel is a mutant now. Aha! Fuck those comic origins. She's really just a Mr. Fantastic knockoff in the powers department, so to spice it up, they make it look all purpley and sparkly because she can harness cosmic powers. Neat. It's a pretty inoffensive show meant for a younger audience that no one bothered to watch. Sounds a lot like her comic book run. A series that was, to my knowledge, well-received but not read by a single person on planet Earth from the sales figures. It makes me question Marvel's desire to keep using characters that bombed in other formats. If the character was never popular in the comics, what makes you think it's going to work in a show or movie, especially if you have to completely change the character in order to suit it? Well, when the first episode couldn't even hit a million viewers, that gave them their answer. Use more of her. Put her in the next Brie Larson Captain Marvel movie. Constantly telling us she is popular and the show is a hit will surely hit some people with FOMO. The show is so mid I struggled to get through it. It's just there. It's not awful. It just also doesn't do anything. The lead actress is charming enough. The cast is pretty good. And Brie Larson shows up at the end to everyone's excitement. <laughs> but yeah, that, that's it. I'll be surprised if it ever gets a second season simply based on the fact that nobody watched it. We are dealing with Disney though, so it probably will actually. <laughs> Moon Knight, a bitterly disappointing presentation of an awesome character diluted by modern Hollywood. Stephen Grant works at a museum in London, attempting to become a tour guide because of his knowledge of ancient Egypt. The sad, sorry motherfucker has what is described as dissociative identity disorder, or multiple personalities for the layperson. Bro Montana ropes himself to the bed at night so he won't sleepwalk into another one of his personalities, but upon waking one evening, he finds himself in the Austrian Alps, where he meets the show's antagonist, Arthur Harrow, a servant of an Egyptian god. See, Stephen possesses a MacGuffin that Arthur wants, and when Arthur tries to take it from him, Stephen blacks out and wakes up two days later in his home. He's contacted by a woman named Layla who's married to a guy named Mark Spector, one of Stephen's personalities. Stephen is tracked down by Arthur Harrow, who sticks a CGI creature on him, and that's when he becomes Moon Knight, one of the coolest looking superhero characters this side of Batman. And in case you didn't know, Moon Knight is essentially Marvel's version of Batman in a lot of ways. So there's that. Moon Knight, or Mark Spector, is an American mercenary who's an avatar for the Egyptian moon god Khonshu. Alright, is that enough for you? It sounds convoluted, but it's not that bad once you start watching the show. The problem with Moon Knight isn't the acting, the characters, or the premise. Oscar Isaac is awesome as the lead character, or should I say characters? And Ethan Hawke is good in almost anything he does. Moon Knight makes for an interesting character and would be fascinating to see alongside an Avengers squad. Maybe he'd actually bring some life to a team that will most likely be led by charisma-deprived Shang-Chi, Captain Marvel, and pseudo-Black Panther. What lets the show down is its inability to give Moon Knight enough space to function on his own. You don't really see a lot of the hero himself in costume, and by the end of the short television show, He's already had to be rescued by typical strong female counterpart, and it climaxes with a goofy CGI monster fight that looks absolutely fucking absurd. Moon Knight's a pretty dark and bloody character, so turning it into a Disney Plus show waters the entire thing down considerably. Too short for its own good, it squanders a cool thing before it really even picks up any momentum at all. This one leans towards bad, but is more disappointing than anything else. Hopefully Moon Knight does return, and someone does the character justice. What If is the MCU version of the comic book series of the same name. It's an animated kind of anthology series that questions what would happen if certain things changed in the MCU from the main timeline and explores them. Like what if Captain Carter became Captain America? What if T'Challa became Star-Lord? Some pretty wacky scenarios that make for surprisingly good short episodes. 
The What If Show is a fine example of what you can do when there are no stakes to the overall MCU narrative, kind of like the praise I gave to Werewolf by Night. Because there isn't any real pressure, creators get to explore and do real character work, which is pretty impressive for short 30 to 40 minute episodes. I loved the animation in this series, and they did get most of the original actors to come back and voice the characters. They couldn't get Tom Holland to reprise his role as Spider-Man, assuming due to contract issues with Sony, but it works nonetheless. The biggest bit of praise I want to throw at this show, though, is the Doctor Strange episode. It goes over what would happen to Strange if his girlfriend Christine died in the car accident that made him lose the ability to use his hands originally. And instead of trying to rescue his career as a surgeon, he sought out the Ancient One and became Sorcerer Supreme because he wanted to bring Christine back. It's a pretty heart-wrenching episode, and this is exactly the kind of thing Multiverse of Madness could and should have been. It's pretty ironic that a cartoon taking place in the MCU was far more serious, compelling, and character-driven than the movie the character was sidelined in. The situation is comparable to the Spawn movie and animated series that both came out in 1997. The movie was childish rubbish, while the cartoon was excellent in story and characterization and was what the movie should have been. Long live animation, everyone. All in all, the show is solid but also not necessary at all, like most of these. It's completely skippable and exists to provide more Disney Plus content, but if you really want something MCU related that isn't trash, you can't go wrong with What If. The Guardians of the Galaxy special is an unnecessary bit of content, but fun nonetheless. Stop me if you've heard me say that one already. It's useless time filler with heart. Typical of James Gunn's run with the Guardians, the story is character driven with some nice little twists that don't add anything to the Guardian story, but does add some depth to the heroes. After purchasing the area known as Nowhere, Mantis and Drax decide to get Star-Lord a Christmas present since he's still upset over losing Gamora. They fly to Earth and kidnap Kevin Bacon, Peter's favorite actor, and the reason for his heroism. Yeah, that's the concept. Very James Gunn. It's an excuse to have a celebrity cameo, it's an excuse to have a throwaway holiday show, but it exists, I had to watch it, and I didn't hate it. What do you want me to say? It's also one of the last times we're ever going to see this Guardians crew together, and since they've been consistently one of the best reasons to watch the MCU since 2014, I'm not complaining. Although I will say, I only watched it because I was going to review it. That's how much Phase 4 has sucked the excitement out of me by overflowing everyone with content. It wasn't terrible by any stretch, but at this point, exhaustion had set in, and had already set in when the show arrived, since I didn't watch it until 5 months after its release. This overindulgence in product makes every MCU release feel so unspecial. But there. That's it. That's everything. God damn it, did this make me realize just how true the oversaturation complaint about Phase 4 was. This has been the most intense video series I've done so far, and I'm so happy it's over. I'm just, I'm, I'm just done. In the poetic words of Porky Pig, that's all folks. GG's.